we are trying to understand the world of international trade and and we know there are over 200 countries in the world and more than 15,000 different items are exported and imported by different countries and so we know and understand that the world itself is complex and what we want to do now and particularly in this course is to understand the principles which can explain why do countries trade and also what are the consequences of foreign trade and this is what we do in economics what we do is we understand the world is complex so what we do is we'll make very simplifying assumptions and move into the abstract world where we'll argue in a logical manner and come up with economic models and these simple economic models which seem to be an abstract abstraction these will be so powerful that they will try to explain the real world phenomena so this is what we intend to do here so what we'll do is we'll make some very basic assumptions and we'll modify them as and when needed and I'll spend some more time on these basic assumptions because I would like this to also serve as a quick review of whatever you have learned in economics courses earlier. The first assumption we make is economic agents are rational and have perfect knowledge. When we use the term economic agents, what we have in mind are consumers, people who buy stuff, and producers, people who produce stuff or are in business. So the first assumption is these producers and, age, uh, and consumers are rational. Now, what do we mean by rationality? Rationality simply means you are doing the best you can under the circumstances. Now look at consumer behavior. The ultimate purpose of consumption is to get some satisfaction and that is the reason as to why you buy stuff to get some satisfaction. So as consumers, rational behavior will be that you want to maximize your satisfaction from consumption. What about businesses? as well as, say, producers, their objective is to maximize total profits. And as long as they take steps to do so, we believe it is rational behavior. That is how rationality is defined. Or in other words, as long as you're doing the best you can under the circumstances, you are rational. Then we also believe economic agents have perfect knowledge and that means they know all that has to be known about a market, a product, and so on. Or in other words, no one is an ignorant fool. The second assumption we make is we are looking at a two by two by two world. Or in other words, two, there are two countries in the world and as an example, let's call them US and India. We'll treat US as the home country and India as the foreign country. Each of these two countries, that is US and India, they produce and consume two goods. And these two goods will be clothing, which will denote by the letter C, and food, which will denote by letter F. So two countries, two goods and to produce these two goods two factors of production are required or two inputs are required one we'll call labor which will for which we'll use l to designate labor and the second input or factor of production being capital represented by the letter k so two countries two goods and two factors of production and this is the minimum we require in order to understand international trade. Why? Because 
when we say international trade, we are trying to understand export and imports. And so we need at a minimum two commodities or two goods, one to be exported, the other one to be imported. And when you are looking at exports and imports, what you require are two countries. You produce something and you sell it to another country and so on. So this is why we require this at a minimum, a two by two by two world. As I was going through assumption two, what you must have realized is we are looking at more than one market at a time. There are two countries, then there are two goods and two factors of production. And the reason why we do this is one is to understand foreign trade and at the same time be able to trace the consequences on different parts or the sectors of the economy or essentially what we are getting into is called general equilibrium analysis and by this we mean we study two or more markets simultaneously or at the same time. This has to be compared to what you learned in principles of microeconomics where you studied market for one product at a time and that is all. So if for example if your interest was to understand how prices are determined in the market for coffee that's what you would focus on and that is all and when you do that kind of analysis it's called partial equilibrium analysis so you should know the difference between general equilibrium and partial equilibrium analysis and once again general equilibrium analysis is when you study two or more markets at the same time the third assumption we make about economic agents behavior is absence of money illusion and by this we mean economic agents that is consumers and producers base their decisions on real rather than nominal variables or another way to look at it is economic agents base their decisions based on relative rather than absolute level of prices and this requires some explanation and so I'll give you some examples in order to understand why we make decisions based on real rather than nominal variables, consider a very simple example. Suppose I earn $10 as income and my whole income is spent on food and you can make up your own example. For example, you just buy apples and if the average price per unit of food is $1, how many units of food can I buy? And and when we do this, let us assume for sake of simplicity that I save nothing and I borrow nothing. So whatever income I earn, I just spend it on food. So based on this, when my income is $10 and price of a unit of food is $1, what is the maximum units of food I can buy? It will be 10 units. Now 10 units the food that I can buy given my income and prices is called my real income and the money that I earn as in dollars is called nominal income. So once again nominal income is the income we receive as in dollars. In that example my nominal income is ten dollars and what is real income? Real income is what we can buy given nominal income and prices or in other words real income is nominal income adjusted for prices or price level. Now in order to understand the meaning of absence of money illusion consider the following. Suppose my income doubles now from $10 it becomes $20. Will I double my consumption of food or will I keep it the same? Now in order to for me to make a decision as to what will happen to my purchase of food, I, food, that decision would depend upon what happens to price of food. For example, if price of food stays the same, what should happen to my consumption of food? It should double, right? And if the price doubles, 
and my income doubles as well what happens to my consumption of food nothing it stays the same so the point here is when your income doubles you just don't go out and double your consumption what you do is you also check out the prices and then you make a decision based on how much can you buy given your income and prices so you are making this decision based on real variables and you know the definition of real income and this simply means you do not suffer from money illusion or there is absence of money illusion